Welcome everyone and hello. I'm Dan Berner. And for 20 years, I worked at Expedia in the middle between the service and application services teams and the presentation, the front end teams. Sometimes embedded in one, sometimes the other, but always trying to champion a better way where we can use the APIs uh, to power our customer experiences, move faster, and allow the back end teams and the front end teams to modernize with all the changes that they face. Today's talk, we're going to talk about GraphQL, we're going to talk about REST, and I'm going to try to to change your minds on a misconception. But most importantly, we're going to talk about how we just don't put enough emphasis, enough thoughtfulness, enough platform mindset to this middle tier. And I think it's really crucial because whether we do it well or not it makes a big difference to the products, to the, to the customers' experiences, and ultimately to our business. Now, I said middle, but I really meant the middle between these two layers. So we're going to zoom right into them and whether we call it aggregation, integration, orchestration, experience, it doesn't matter, right? The point isn't what we call it. The point is that we attend to it, that we really focus on this important area of the stack. We got to mind this gap and it is not being attended to in the way that it needs to be. And that's because it's not just a problem of two fixed platforms and a bunch of wires between, right? These two sides of our stack are constantly under pressure right? They're churning. Front end stacks are being rewritten to take advantage of new frameworks. Back end stacks are moving to the cloud. They're taking advantage of new architectures. There's just constant change and let alone mergers and acquisitions. There is just an infinite amount of churn that's going on here. And I was on the team that at Expedia, we did all of these acquisitions for Travelocity and Orbitz and Hotels.com and a bunch of others. And I'll tell you that the pressure that puts on your platform Many of you probably have gone through that. It is serious. So we're trying to build bridges between an area that are moving, right? These are under change. So I think that when we evaluate a strategy for this important layer, we shouldn't be asking ourselves this question, right? This is just the wrong question. We think every time we bring in a new technology, it needs to replace the old. It just isn't the right framing. Instead, we take advantage of that new approach, what does it bring to the party? So we're going to talk about what's the right question that we should be asking. And I think it's these. I would pose that these are the right questions that we should be asking when we consider what we want to do with the middle tier. How do we deliver rapid self-service to all those front end clients? Because they're not waiting. The product team's not waiting. They're at the beck and call of every new idea and every pressure that the customer's um, side of the house is bringing to that front end. And secondly, how do we provide an insulating contract? I mentioned that both of those layers are under change. So we need a contract that's flexible enough to allow the front end teams to get new information or make changes, but stable enough they're not being broken by our back end changes. And thirdly, how can we not just preserve all the investments right, in our REST tier or in our data tier or in other forms of APIs in the back office, but actually magnify them. And we're going to talk about how we can do that as well. And finally, and this is an area I think we've almost not considered for this middle last mile tier, how do we govern this thing? What happens as it scales and how do we manage it? So let's talk about how the strategies that we've tried in the last, say, 10 or 15 years have worked out. And let's score them across those questions. Now, the first one we all recognize, it's almost a not my problem approach, right? We're going to let the clients manage it. And this is kind of funny now, but this was actually how we built all the first class of mobile and native experiences. And it, I'm here to tell you, I was there, you were maybe at your company. This actually does work. It takes a lot of people. It takes a lot of time, but all of the main apps that we all um, love, you know, Uber was built this way, Expedia's was built this way, Yelp was built this way, right? Because the integration was rich, all that data came in, the orchestration logic, the service management, all that was put into each application. Although that works and we built some amazing businesses on it, there's an absolutely real cost of that. And that is that those applications get really complicated. They're hard to build, they get a lot of code, and as that code is written, of course, there's inconsistencies that show up. The ways that the Android, the iOS, and the web team handled a particular thing will start to vary. 
And then the pressure only gets worse when you start to do experimentation and then everything starts to drift apart. So look, that's not so bad, right? Lots of businesses were run this way for over a decade. But the problem comes is that inevitably that front end client platform code base has to be rewritten. Either because we need to move to say mobile responsive web or we need to adopt the latest frameworks on the native space. There is constant pressure there. And when that rewrite happens, everything goes away, right? We lose all of that. And I'll tell you that a product manager um, at Expedia once asked me this question. He says, how can we call it test and learn if we forget everything that we learned about our experiments every time we rewrite our clients? And it's a good question. So let's score the client side sort of approach according to the questions. And I don't think we can give it a good score in any of these dimensions, right? It's not fast. It took a lot of effort. There's no insulation, right? We've bound together our front end clients directly to our back end services. They're intertwined. So if we change one, we got to change the other. We haven't magnified it. We haven't done anything to enhance a particular service that we're leveraging. We just are absorbing them all and making them all work. And frankly, there's no governance here, but that's because pointedly for the API architects, this wasn't their problem, right? We didn't sign up for this. This was something that the client teams had to deal with. So let's see what happened after, right? All of us felt this pain and there was a natural response. And in 2015, there was a blog post, an engineer that had worked at SoundCloud was talking about what they had tried to do to solve this problem. And they coined this phrase, a backend API for front ends or a BFF. Obviously it plays on the pun of BFF being best friends forever. We're going to get to that forever part in a little bit, but I think it was a cute idea and it actually was a good idea. It was a reasonable first response. And just going to look at that diagram to see how much complexity we have insulated those front end clients from. So this was a huge step forward and a recognition that the clients needed something more than they were getting from just those direct access APIs. In the beginning, the concept was one per presentation framework. So maybe one for native, maybe one iOS and Android, if they were that different, one for the web. And that's not so bad. We've certainly, you know, we've got the same number of clients. We have the same number of pieces of code, but this code at least is separated, right? It's in a layer that doesn't have to go away just because we move to React or Angular or Swift UI. So that's a step in the right direction. But 2019, Martin Fowler says it, and I'm just going to read you the quote. While the BFF pattern might originally have meant um, dedicated backends for each front end channel or platform, it can easily be extended to mean a backend for every micro front end. And he was prophetic because as we've moved to component micro front end architectures where we break up our big applications into pieces so we can reuse them from places in our customer experiences, we get an Oprah style architecture. You get a BFF and you get a BFF. And before you know it, there is a micro BFF for every single micro front end. He was right. And I will say, this actually makes sense. If you are a full stack front end team, this is how you do, this is how you move fast. You, you copy paste some code, you solve your problem, you give it to your front end team. It's a nice tight contract and you move on. But we just have to talk about this because this becomes completely ungovernable. And the diagram might look like I'm making fun and I'm kind of making this crazy diagram of all these um, bubbles and lines, but this is 80 BFFs. I got tired drawing the diagram at 80. We have many customers that have a hundred, some that have 200 and one that has more than 500. These are all brands, you know, and use probably on a daily basis. So if we were going to be honest about this and score it, what would we say? I think we would say, that from the perspective of those front end teams, this is more rapid. I think we can do better, but this actually puts the control in those front end teams. They can move self-service and build what they need. And copy paste is pretty fast. Has some downsides, but it's pretty fast. There's an insulating contract at least halfway, right? The front end is insulated from the complexity of the back end. Doesn't really address anything for the back end being insulated from the client, but we'll talk about that in a minute. It 
doesn't, though, magnify anything, right? It definitely leverages the services that are out there, but we're cloning and duplicating that orchestration and that leverage over and over in every single BFF. And governance is really just completely missing from this. And it doesn't surprise me, it shouldn't surprise you, because this was never intended to be in the tens or hundreds, right? We built this for, it was gonna be a couple of things that the front end team built. It wasn't even a consideration for the API and the governance folks. And I will tell you, wake up, because you don't want this happening at your organization. The amount of tech debt is kudzu level, and it is very difficult to get rid of. So this is something to pay attention to. So you might expect that it's time to talk about GraphQL, and it's time to consider what GraphQL can do for this problem of the middle. And let me just start by saying, look, GraphQL is a translation layer. That's its whole job. It's been called a lingua franca, meaning a, a translation language between the needs, in this case, of the presentation tier and what they need, and the application realities and services, whether those are REST, gRPC, whether they're an event bus, a data source, a content management system. It's really agnostic about that. It's just trying to say, I can pull that data together, translate it into the needs of the front end teams, which is what those BFFs were trying to do. Let's go walk through now for our four kind of questions, how GraphQL addresses each. So first, the rapid self-service. We tried it with endpoints, that didn't scale. <clears throat> what if we take a lesson from another part of our stack, right? We know how to describe uh, what we want from a source of data, right? That's a query. We've been doing that for 60 years. If we apply that to the API tier, we get something like this, right? I can describe uh, you know, a representation declaratively of the data that I want and its relationship. And somebody else, right, a GraphQL router, works through and finds through the resolvers the underlying services, brings that data back, composes it together, and returns it to me. Importantly, there are gonna be an infinite proliferations of requests, right? What each client needs is different and will constantly change. We just can't keep spinning up endpoints to address that. We have to find a better way. And I think with queries, we have. So that's the first job or the first question that we wanna evaluate, rapid self-service. And next, that insulating contract. So what's the story here? Well, here, I think the key observation is this. The entities, the core sort of business nouns of your business are the most stable, arguably the most important, but the most stable part of our stack, right? For, you know, whether that's customer or order or quote, those things are near eternal. They were born when the platform was born right? Because they represent some key concept of the business. And they don't change just because we change and go to the cloud or bring in Kubernetes or bring in React. That doesn't change those things. That's the fundamental part of the business. But here's the problem. We've never had a place to encode that model that wasn't directly bound into the code that we used to implement it. Whether that's in the data tier or the API tier or the presentation model. The problem has been no place where we can hold on to that declaratively such that when we inevitably have to change something on the front end or in the middle or in the back, the contract survives. Implementation changes. That's the only way we're going to avoid this Sisyphusian rock rolling up and down the hill as we re-architect. And the cycle time, as we all know, for re-architecture and re-platforming is only increasing. So that's the importance of schemas and what we call entities in GraphQL to capture that model in a declarative way. Next, we want to magnify our investments. We don't want to just preserve them. And I, I mentioned it above, but I want to just underline it. No one's coming for your REST services, right? No REST service should be rewritten because we have some other API technology. That's not what we do in, in the real world, right? We leverage what we have. We only change things when we need to. So what we want, though, is we like to get a magnification effect of all the different services. So let's take a quick story through two teams and two APIs, product and review. Now, there's a natural relationship between those two, right? I mean, you make reviews about products. Products have a list of reviews. So there's obviously some kind of key relationship there. And we know exactly how to encode that at the data tier. Right? We've been doing this forever. We have a primary key. There's a join that the client can use. 
But what do we do in the API tier? In the API tier, either both of those services kind of return a shared key that the client can then use to make subsequent calls and do their own join, or if that's sort of inefficient, sometimes we cheat and we denormalize a little bit and we give the review data has the product name and maybe the product category or product description because we don't want that to call the product service every time we look at a review because it's not very performant. We can do better than that. So let's look at how GraphQL Federation deals with this. And you might not be surprised, we do it in that same declarative layer, right? We indicate, we have these two entities and we just indicate the relationship between them with that key. And what that does is pretty profound though. Look at that query. I can now see the product and I can ask information about it and I see all these children that I can ask questions about. And specifically, review and ratings are right there for me. And their relationship between the two is just naturally expressed the way I would expect it to be. Now, I don't know when I'm making that query that there's two services, one in product and one in reviews. One might be in the cloud, one might be in the data center. They could be implemented, totally different teams, different folks. I don't know that and I just don't care. So you can imagine the power of this idea spread out across all those entities and all your entities so that every team's API can link where it is appropriate to the work that other teams do. <clears throat> and that's what gives us composition. That's what gives us the leverage to maximize our investment, not just maintain it. Which brings us to our fourth question. How do we govern this middle, this layer? And the answer here, there's two things I want to share. One, we do it with a single endpoint and a declarative layer. Instead of trying to manage hundreds of endpoints which and code, we have all of our schemas and all of our entities in one place. So we can see what this layer is in one place. We can reason about it. That's important. But we can take advantage of the fact that it's static and it's declarative, just like the folks in Terraform and Kubernetes have, right? This idea of declarative policy is incredibly powerful. So let's show you a teeny example of this. Here I've got a schema for a query that's gonna ask for information about customer data. And you can look at that blue there, that at requires scope, that's an annotation that we've put right on the type that says, hey, if you wanna access this customer data, you have to have this scope. You have to have read permission, if you will, from, uh, for customers. And where did that come from? That probably came from a JWT token that was extracted and we can do that in the GraphQL router and apply it and, and, and compare those numbers and we can enforce that policy right in the graph layer. I'm not talking about this as the only point of governance or control for our security, right? We're gonna do defense in depth at all the layers we should, but this is a new place to put uh, governance in. And I think it's a fascinating way to think about what would it mean if we can start decorating our policies directly on our schemas, right? What does it mean for security, for data access, for data privacy? This is a really profound way to think about um, governance, and I'm really excited to see a lot of organizations take advantage of this. So here we're at the scorecard here. I think we can see why we check these all these uh, ticks off, right? We've got rapid self-service with queries, not endpoints. We've got an insulating contract via schemas, right, where we're capturing the enduring model, allowing to evolve, but not having to throw it away every time. So I'd say maybe insulating and enduring. And then we're magnifying with Federation. We're allowing each team to focus on what they do best, but where those APIs can join and connect, they can express that and take advantage of that. And then finally, we have a new way to do governance with declarative policies and even just a new place to see everything about our middle. So GraphQL versus REST? I don't think so. I think it's GraphQL and REST. They just work better together. And our customers agree. There are, we're working with hundreds of customers from every vertical, banking, retail, travel, and sports. And you, all of these customers are finding the advantage of using this declarative layer to get their hands around this middle, to, f to accelerate their front end teams with an insulating layer to leverage their investments and to just move faster. So Major League Baseball, it's, it's playoff season, it's about to be World Series. Um, Major League Baseball has leveraged the heck out of this architecture and we're gonna meet 
um, one of the leaders of that team to tell us more about that in just a second. Um, and in fact, let me just introduce Rob Engel, Vice President of Software Engineering at MLB. Well, welcome, Rob. Thanks for taking time out. I know it's a really busy time of the year for Major League Baseball. Um, we've got, what, one team is in and one we're waiting on? Yep, yep. Tonight, uh, the Diamondbacks and the, the Phillies face off to see who's going to play the Rangers in the World Series on Friday. Oh, well, someday the Mariners will be there, Rob. Someday. Can't lose hope. Um, all right, let's start. Give us a little bit of a history of your you know, tenure at MLB, um, what you were working on over those years, and maybe what you're focusing on now. Uh, sure. Yeah, so thanks for having me. Rob Engel, Vice President of Software Engineering for, uh, for Major League Baseball. Um, since I began about 13 years ago, I've been focused mostly on the stats area. So everything that happens on the field. We have a program called StatCast, which encompasses uh, 12 cameras we have on the field, capturing every movement of every person and the ball, uh, layering that on top of our traditional play-by-play, -play, understanding who grounded out to first, or you know, box score level stats, such as batting average, uh, and combining all of that with our, our large-scale APIs that have scheduling, um, line score information, and really blending that all together with the, the fan experience and a lot of the business-to-business -business experiences and even direct-to-club experiences for data acquisition. That must be a tremendous amount of data. Oh, it's a lot. It's a, at this point, we're getting about over 40 terabytes of data alone per season, not including raw video. Oh, that's amazing. So the stats... I imagine that you know the job of trying to track player statistics and give this data has been the same for 13 years, but boy, I bet the technology has changed. What was it like? Can you take us on that journey from when you first built the stats system to maybe where you are uh, now? Uh, certainly, yeah, so yeah, roughly 13 years ago when I joined, the entire ecosystem consisted of uh, just flat XML files, and that's how all the apps would work. Uh, whether it's the website, uh, the iOS app, the Android app, the Windows phone app at the time. And they would all have their own kind of custom flavor of an XML file that they would read. And uh, we have a bunch of different teams with MLB, app development teams. There's a group that manages the ticketing service. There's the group that I've been part of that manages the stats. Another group that manages CMS, so video highlights, uh, player stories, things of that ilk. And then uh, there's more and more groups that have data that's central to our product. So if you've ever used the MLB app or gone to the MLB.com homepage, you'll see that you have a list of scores and games and all this rich data that's married to it. So when I began, the only way that the company had set up a, a means to get all this data to an individual page was to just have transforms that would hit each individual service running on a Chrome job, spit it out as an XML file, and they would do this custom for each uh, individual client because each client wanted their own little flavor of it that might be slightly different than the other. So this became an issue when anytime I wanted to add a new attribute per se, we'd have to go and regenerate hundreds if not thousands and hundreds of thousands of files all dating all the way back to the beginning of baseball. So very batch oriented, regenerate, publish, and then it's... Exactly. And then it just led to inconsistencies because different client developers wanted different attribute names that might actually be pointing to the same fi uh, value across different XML files. So. At some point, we needed to say, all right, let's modernize the stack and build a dynamic API on top of it that, as a request comes in, can dynamically fetch the different data from the various data sources we need. So it all kind of starts with the schedule. So my team has always overseen the schedule. You need to understand all the list of games that you're looking at. And from that, you have an identifier for each game and each team. You can go out and fetch necessary information from the ticketing to understand what the prices of the tickets are, which page to link them to, uh, video highlights, uh, pulling that in, player highlights, um, some personalization aspects about what players and teams you follow. You're, you're describing a lot of the jobs of the middle, right? We're, we're aggregating, we're orchestrating, we're connecting, we're integrating. Um, you, but the stats API you built because of its sort of, um, of, its, uh, of its time range when it was built. This is a REST API, right, that exactly. you built, and it works? Tell us about this REST API. Yeah, it, it works. Yeah, I am. It, it works really well, uh, in my opinion. It serves about three billion requests per day uh, at, at peak traffic, and it, it manages to hit all these disparate services, kind of stitch them together, and make a one-stop shop for the clients to get what they need. So it's been successful in that you know we could add an attribute now, and it backpropagates automatically without having to regenerate batch files. 
we don't need every client to understand, as you mentioned earlier, all the different data sources and then doing that stitching together client side. So if the REST API was working, what brought you to the graph? What, what were you looking for from a GraphQL tier atop those existing you know, REST services or content systems? Well, I'll be frank, uh, and like many of you in the audience, I didn't necessarily go out looking for the graph. The graph kind of found me. Uh, I was happy, a lot of our team was happy with the way we had things. Yeah. But it got to the point where our responses were so bloated. You'd have a mobile client pulling in this massive file and extracting maybe 5%, 10% of the different attributes that they even need. Um, so the graph was appealing in that, okay, you could, the client could get only what they need. It'll reduce the bandwidth, so it'll make the, the calls faster, um, and it'll save on you know pay-per-gig plans as well. You don't want this massive megabyte file coming down every time you're refreshing the scoreboard every 10 seconds. So that was the first thing that really stuck out, and that they, the client can get exactly what they need. Um, but then with, with the, the Apollo telemetry, it was even more fascinating. Not only can the client get what they need, we as a company know end to end what attributes are even being used. Yeah. Historically with REST APIs, you don't know. You said, I want to deprecate a field, let's remove it and cross our fingers and hope nobody's using it and see who complains. Now with the Apollo telemetry, we, we can't even get into that situation because we know exactly what fields are being used and by whom. And that must help you with dealing with that intense pressure of all those billions of requests, right? Because you can optimize with caching or what have you, which data isn't going to be requested and needs to be yeah. fast and, and perform it. Um, let's talk about when, so you named your, what did you name your, your graph tier? Uh, it's called midfield. <laughs> so this is a joke on infield being present. Yeah, take us through that. Yeah, so it's between the infield and the outfield. So and you have here uh, the infield being uh, the actual consumer-facing applications, our MLB app, uh, MLB.tv, our ballpark app, uh, and then our outfield here is like all the different microservices. Right. Right. So instead of the stats API being the entry point that proxies these other microservices, yeah. um, this midfield tier, this graph tier, uh, has tangential benefits beyond what we just discussed. So you see here, the stats API has a team that manages not only just the stats in that domain, but also the API and the scaling, they would be pulling in data from the ticketing services, from the video services, and there's no domain expertise in there, and it's more or less a pass-through. So they weren't domain experts, but to the client teams, they had to be you know, accountable for what that data was. So there was the ultimate orchestrator originally. Exactly. So where midfield is nice is it moves some of that logic up one level so that the stats team can focus on their domain, which is stats. Ticketing can focus on their domain, which is ticketing. Video, video, uh, so on and so forth. So now these teams can really hyper-focus on their domain, making the best uh, microservice or suite of services available and focus on what they need to. And then over in the midfield layer, we can just pull the best of what they need and in fact, let the clients dictate, oh, I need yeah. A link for ticketing, I need a video highlight, I need a score of a game, uh, and I need a player's you know, full name or their you know, last name, first name. And they could get it exactly how they want it without having the different teams back here to have knowledge of each other or creating a problem downstream um, where all the clients are re-implementing the exact same logic from yeah. device to device, from team to team, et cetera. And has that helped your because I know that you've, you know, MLB's expanded, obviously, native apps, and you know, iPad was amazing, the first ones that came out. But TV, as you expand all those clients, is it now easier for those clients to come up yeah. to speed rather than originally when they were all hardwired in? Yeah, so what we end up here in, in this graph layer is we, we find these common queries that all of these different consumer-facing products on the left here all have the same kind of representation of this is what a game looks like. This is what your stats look like. So the first mover was iOS and Android. Yeah. They really built and worked with the midfield team on what that first kind of query looks like to represent a game. Once that was codified, then it was easy enough for the other clients to come on board and say, that's exactly what I want too. Um, and once you do that, you're not reinventing the wheel client to client on every nuance of you know, that's right. things. So a good example, uh, right now, Rangers clinched a spot yeah. in the World Series yeah. last night but we don't know who they're playing yet. And we don't know what time they're playing yet on Friday. So a classic example that this benefits us with and has bidden us in the past 
is every client application would need to write logic that figures out how to handle a to-be-determined start time. Yeah. So we know the game's on Friday, game one of the World Series, but we don't know what time it is. And we don't know the two teams. We don't even know the two teams playing in it yet. So when they have to present the schedule in their, all their customer experiences, they got to write special code or something, right? Exactly. So I've been here 13 years now, and I've been through two, three, four rewrites of all of these apps over here on the infield layer. Every time we see the same thing, the handling of the to-be-determined start time, the unknown team, an opponent, and through the playoffs, and in the regular season, this notion of a suspended and resumed game, and we just see it every Double time. headers that start after the first game must be... Exactly, yeah. The, you, see, you don't know when the second game's going to start because the first game has to end. So how does the graph solve that? What, what, what's an approach you're using to you know, address that problem without all that custom code in the front end? That's a great question. So we have our, our services here in the outfield. We don't need to touch those. Those give us the raw data we need fast. Uh, clients, we don't even need to touch those. In the midfield layer, in this graph layer, we're able to tailor the responses to make sure it does all that extra little mm -hmm. business logic. Mm -hmm. Taking raw data and effectively adding presentation logic into that layer and you know we got ahead of the sprawl just a little bit. Instead yeah. of having 50, 80, or 500 like some customers, yeah. BFFs, this was not our first BFF. We, yeah. we, there were a few things we built in-house and we quickly identified, okay, there's multiple app teams that are going this direction. Let's standardize it and centralize it. Yeah. So we got out in front of it and that allows us to do things like a hot fix to this to be determined time. Right. That could just be done at that midfield layer. Clients don't need to make a change. We don't need to go all the way upstream to talk about to the teams about making, you know, a mid-game deployment to an upstream API. That well, and how do you deploy to the App Store and hit a Friday deadline, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's classically been a problem. Yeah. yeah. So we don't want we don't have to deal with that anymore. It can be done in a matter of minutes. Oh, that's fantastic. So, what is it meant? Because um, we're all technologists, so we think about it from our architectural support and performance and scale and handling all that load and maybe even the customer experience, but from the business, has this made a difference in how MLB has been able to adapt to different opportunities? Or what, so what does the chief product officer think of the midfield graph, I guess I'm asking? Yeah, it's made a huge difference. So what we've introduced this year is a, a personalization aspect where now that we've moved this midfield tier layer uh, up there, we have user information. That's one of our, kind of our subgraphs, if you will. Right. So now that we know about each user on the server side, we could do things with a, your favorite team or your favorite players, and we could build new displays that really personalizes your experience without having to do all that logic on the client side across every sim, uh, right. platform and device, or pushing that into some arbitrary service all the way up at the outfield layer here. Uh, that midfield layer is perfect for it. We know you're the user identification, some attributes about them, and we can personalize it um, so that's been a huge push for the, the business recently is personalization. So just lowering, what I'm hearing is lowering the cost of, the, of what starts out as customization becomes you know, a feature that you can roll out in a you know, standardized way without having to change all parts of your stack, right? It doesn't come across all the way. You just pick the layer that does the job for you. Um, I love that story. Let's, let's imagine that you were two or three years ago, Rob, and really proud of that REST stats API, had done a lot of the orchestration sort of by hand, um, was supporting a huge and you know important business. And um, what would you want yourself to know that you have you know come to appreciate about using sort of this graph, this declarative layer? What, what have you learned that you want to share with yourself? Yeah, I think uh, a few. Or maybe out that, the others that are listening. Yeah. Sure. Uh, one really important one is just like a strongly typed data contract. Mm -hmm. The graph enforces that. It's too easy with the BFF layer that you're ro rolling your own thing and could be any. Like, Turning some JSON. Yeah, here's some JSON. It quickly sprawls. And then, yeah, you, you get inconsistencies. Yeah. Uh, it's difficult to debug. Documentation rarely exists. So the graph effectively automatically documents itself because yeah. you have a strongly typed data contract. So that's a huge advantage. Um, another advantage that I would have told myself three years ago is that you know, you're know you not going to have different client teams just moving their logic that may or may not be incorrect at one layer up. Yeah. You're not necessarily solving 
the problem. You're just moving it from one place to another, yeah. which is, as you mentioned earlier, it's still a great thing. It's better. You don't have to do app deployments. Right. Um, so there's nothing wrong with that. But yeah. being able to get out in front of the sprawl and centralizing that business logic, so there's only one place we have to deal with presentation layer logic of TBD times or game twos of double headers or suspended resumed. I think that three years ago probably would not have rendered because I was happy enough, just here's a bunch of bloated data contracts, go let the clients figure it out. Right. But you know, now the clients wanted to get you know, more server-side, we wanted to get in front of that and prevent a big sprawl of BFFs. That makes total sense. I, I want to ask you sort of in a, in, a, in a pointed way, your REST API, your stats API is still there. Yes. The investment you've made in your content system, still there. Yes. You haven't rewritten things because of the midfield. You're just, what, orchestrating them, exposing them, composing them? Is that how you think of it? Yeah, that's a, that's a great way. In fact, uh, we, we found a, a GraphQL library that's code-driven that we're able to take, a, I'll call it a legacy stats API, yeah. but it's a Spring Boot Java application, also has a strongly typed data contract. We're able to use a code-driven annotation library called Speaker that you just layer a REST or a GraphQL on top of that REST, and then it automatically exposes that as a subgraph to our midfield tier. Well, we're really excited about that example, and we're going to be doing some work in the year to come for just that reason. To, how can we get our existing services onto the graph more quickly so we can start taking advantage of them and then composing them together with Federation? So um, I love the whole story. Um, do you have a pick, a favorite, for which team you want to see go to the World Series here to go up against the Rangers? I, it, after 13 years, I root for uh, devious reasons. Uh, you, yeah, what is the yeah. best fan? Yeah, or for my, myself personally, I, I'm going to be going to the World Series. Ah. So Philadelphia can get cold. <laughs> They're slated for game three right now, and last I checked, have a start time temperature of 34 degrees. Okay. And uh, Phoenix is an hour and a half flight. From so <laughs> I have selfish motivations at this point for my rooting interests. All right, well, <laughs> we'll be going for the Diamondbacks, I guess. Yes. All right. Well, thanks so much for the conversation. I really appreciate it. Thanks for taking time out, and thanks for, the, for MLB for letting you come share all this information with us. So, well, thanks for thanks having me. Glad to be here. Absolutely. Thank you, Robbie. Thank you.